go on a journey, not by car or by Transperth buses or by train, not even by Qantas, but a journey by camel. And we are, we are on a trail that is on the edge of a desert. So you can't, there's not much to see around here. It's just basically rocks and sand and a few twisted, barely surviving plants along with some little desert lizards and maybe some wild animals. It's very unforgiving. So if you fall here, you might bruise yourself. But we're on a journey. There's an oasis somewhere out there, but we can't go there. We don't want to stop because we are, our destination is Egypt. Are we getting the slides rolling? All right, that will come up very soon. We are following a trail of camels. And the guys on the camels, they're merchants. They're coming from, uh, maybe from Gilead, they got spices and they're heading south to the Nile River Delta. We're not accustomed to doing this, but the men who are on the camel train, they do this for a living. They do this almost every day. On their camels, they have a cargo of spices, maybe balm and myrrh and and other spices that are intended for the lucrative Egyptian market. Are you still with me? We've just started. But more than that, they are carrying a prisoner. A young man who is just 17 years old. And he's sitting on top of one of the camels. He's looking lost and he's looking alone. But that's the person we are interested in. His name is Joseph. His name is Joseph, which means Yahweh increases or the Lord shall add. Because when his dearly beloved mom was pregnant, she named him Joseph, saying that the Lord will add to me another son. Good thing you didn't call him Joseph. You call him Jordan. That would have been a prophecy. The merchants paid just 20 pieces of silver for him. And now that's much less than they would have paid for a fine, skillful, beautiful woman in those days. But it was about uh, the 9 or 12 pieces that they might have paid for an ordinary chap, an ordinary bloke. So Joseph must have had something special about him. Something about the way he looked that inspired even his human traffickers to pay a decent price for him. Which brings me to my first point. When you are a child of God, there is something about you that makes people realize that you are different. Hello? Hello? Amen. That's why I asked you what amen meant. Now don't ask me what it is. I can't always put my finger on it. But there is something in your bearing, the way you carry yourself, the way you walk and talk, the way you move, the way you behave yourself, Something about you makes people go, huh, that person is different. And you go for that job interview and they see the integrity in your eyes and they take one look at you and they say, that's my man, that's my woman for the job. You know what I'm talking about? Christians? They don't know what it is, but you should know. And let me tell you, in case you don't know, it should be the character of Jesus shining through you. Would you say amen this time? Amen. Give God some praise. Now, let's, let's develop this a little further. So, so the Ishmaelites, the camel train people, they get to Egypt. 
And Joseph is sold to a rather high-ranking officer in Pharaoh's military army. The Bible says that Potiphar was the captain of the guard. We're talking about the people who look after the king's safety. So they must be very trustworthy. That means he was high up. We're, we're talking about the special agents, pretty much like the guys who are the security detail of today's prime ministers. That guy's dead, by the way. So the person who bought Joseph was no ordinary citizen. It said something about the caliber of Joseph. You get where I'm going? It's not just about the fact that the Potiphar was high ranking, but if Joseph got sold to that man, there had to be something good about Joseph. So Potiphar's, uh, Potiphar was somebody. Joseph, on the other hand, was a nobody in a certain sense. He arrived in Egypt with nothing but the clothes on his back and possibly the sandals on his feet. Empty handed. He was nobody, so it seemed. And Potiphar might have started out by looking at him and saying, Okay, yeah, you look strong. All right, but I'm going to test you. Come on, go scrub the floor. And Joseph goes, shh, 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 And then Joseph, uh, Potiphar comes around a few minutes later and looks at him and says, Hmm, that's impressive. Good job. Now I want you to go in the kitchen and clean up the kitchen. And Joseph would go, and in no time to finish, and Potiphar would come and say, wow, good job, young man. Now tomorrow morning, I want you to go in my bedroom. Do you see what's happening? There's some progression there. Tomorrow morning, you start cleaning out my bedroom. Clean the whole place out, as a matter of fact. And then he comes back and he says, what? I've never had it done so well before. Potiphar begins to realize that this nobody was really somebody. So he pulls him and says, come on, what is it with you? I've never had anybody clean up my place such a sparkling manner. Listen, wh wh what did you say your name was? And Joseph goes, Joseph. Uh, listen, Joseph, you're doing an amazing job. You're exceptional. And you know what? From now on, I'm going to put everything in your care. Put you in charge of everything you see here. You're the boss. After me, of course. You have everything in my household under your control. Except my wife, of course. From the baker to the cook to the bottle washer, they're all going to take orders from you. The Bible says, somebody wants to read that with me. Potiphar had Joseph in, that was not the Bible, sorry, that was from Josephus Antiquities. It says, Just, Potiphar had Joseph in the greatest honor and taught him the learning that became a free man. And he gave him leave to make use of a diet better than what was allotted to slaves. So from a nobody, the historian tells us, Joseph became a somebody. What are we saying this morning, church? For your announcement, I'm the stewardship director of this church. So this has a stewardship slant to it. And my first point is, second point is this. We came into this world like Joseph. Empty-handed. Empty-handed like Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8. For we brought how much? Nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Here's a picture of a baby sleeping, just like Jordan. Here's a picture of a dead man. Come with nothing, live with nothing. Everything that we see around us carries the label property of somebody. 
And that name that goes in that space is not yours. It is the property of the master designer, God himself. Not even the breath that's in your nostrils. Every time I hear people saying, this is my life, I shake my head. Because I know how easy it can be taken away from you. If something can be taken away from you against your will at any time, it is not yours. True or false? So much for my life. I don't know about you, but I know what it means to be walking around with something that looks like it's mine, but is not mine. Let me give you a story. 2003, I arrived in the Philippines with just a couple of thousands of US dollars. Just enough to get myself and my family settled, register for school, put my kids in school first, and my wife started later and to rent an apartment in a nearby town. That's what it looked like. And the money that was left was just enough to keep us going for three months. I was supposed to be studying for three years. It's all in my book, by the way. But that's all we had. I can never forget the day we used up the last 300 pesos. At that point, <laughs> one US dollar could get you about 54 Filipino pesos. And all we had was 300 pesos. How many US dollars is that? Not much, about six US dollars. Here we were, a family almost broke. And we were staying in that house. And I had not even finished my first semester. But guess what? God owns everything. I thought you'd say amen for that. Because he does. He kept sending pesos. I can't give you the whole story. It's just too long. But God kept sending pesos in sufficient quantities to meet our needs. We had to manage the little that we had, but he sent it. And so there were many days while we were managing the little that we went down to SM. Those of you who are Filipinos, you know SM. And we'd be walking in the rows of super, supermarket aisles and we would, we would pass the nice boxes of cereal that I like for breakfast and just watch them and just keep going because we couldn't afford to buy them. And couldn't afford to put fabric softener in the washing machine. <laughs> those were luxuries in those days. We would just pick them up, look at the price tag and put them back down. So you would understand against that background why some people were shocked that I was driving this car. How was that possible? Yeah, that was me with a little more weight. I used, to, I used to drive this beast all over the place. And, and you know, it was, I, I had a, honestly, I had a certain kind of pride in driving it. It wasn't mine. Trust me, it really wasn't mine. And people would be wondering, how is he driving that car? You know, you, you could hardly hear it coming. It's like, and the windows are tinted, you know, and Ericsson's in there, you can't see it. Just fantastic machine. People always ask me, is that your car? How much do you used to pay for that? And I would say, Haha, you don't really want to know, do you? To avoid the answer. That was me feeling good about something that was not mine. That the Lord in his goodness allowed me to have. But God does not have that problem. He does not go around parading stuff that is not his. God owns everything. The psalmist wrote, Psalm, uh, he wrote in Psalm 50 verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't even tell you, for the world is mine, 
and the fullness thereof. So forget about your successful career and don't glory in your whatever degree or your lucrative business or your bank account. If you think you own that, I've got some news for you today. All that my God has to do is blow on it. And it's gone. Gone, gone like the wind. Friends, let me, let me bring it a little closer home. All you have to do is see a bushfire getting close to your house. And you realize how transient all of that is. This is bushfire country. Anybody was close to the fires recently, Baldivis? Yep. You know, the, you know the, the sheer dread of seeing the prospect of your house go up in flames. It can be taken away. And then what it says, all that we handle is whose? The Lord's. And we have no right of ourselves to anything, not even to an existence. All our money, time, talents belong to God and are lent to us by him that we may accomplish the work that he has given us to do. He has given us the charge. What does the charge say? Occupy till I come. Here you go. Manage that for me until I come back. And God looks down at you and he looks down at me and he sees us like Joseph, sold into the slavery of sin. And he looks beyond what we are, find God, and he sees what we can be. And so, at the highest bidder, he buys us with his own blood from the auction block of sin. Potiphar goes and he sees this. Why do I always do that? I have nothing to show, man. Anyway, Sonny, he sees big, strong Joseph, six-pack. Biceps, etc. And he says, I want that guy. Jesus purchased us with his own blood. He bought us from the auction block. He takes us from being a nobody, brings us into his household, and makes us into somebody. Thank God for amazing grace. The story doesn't stop there. Just like Joseph, he entrusts us with responsibilities. He says, here you are. Take this. Here, I've given you the talent of teaching. Teach this Sabbath school class for me. I've given you the talent of caring. Go serve as a deacon or as a deaconess. Here, I've given you these kids. Kid, singular. Raise this child, these children for me. Here, I've given you this bank account. Manage it for me. You're in charge. Yeah, I've given you six days to work. Come on, use it to produce something for me. But don't touch the seventh day. It's my day. It's holy. Don't touch the tithe. It's holy unto me. And don't defile that body of yours by unhealthy practices. It is holy unto me. It is my temple. It is holy. So even while God puts stuff in our hands, he tells us, there are some things that are holy. They are reserved for me. They are set apart. Please don't touch those. Are we making sense this morning? And God looks down and he sees you. He sees me. His former slave. Uh, slave from the auction block. That he's bought with his own blood. He sees us using our time and our energies and our influence and our money and our physical strength. You name it. Intellectual abilities. Everything to honor and glorify him and to build up his kingdom. And he takes note that like Joseph, everything that we touch smells of integrity. And he looks at you and he says, sister, brother, wow, you're doing a good job. He says, come up higher. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The story doesn't stop there. What happened to Joseph? I would like to stop there. The story doesn't end there. No, Jack, it doesn't. Joseph's faith and integrity were tr tested by severe trials. There was still something about that physique, of which I can't boast, and about his deportment, 
of which I dare not boast, that got the attention of the only person over whom he had no authority, and that was Mrs. Potiphar. I did a little external reading on Mrs. Potiphar and Joseph's situation, and I thought I'd add a little bit of spice to the whole. St I don't know how true it is, but it came from an extra biblical source. And one source indicates that Potiphar's wife was so in love with Joseph that she gave him the nicest garments to wear and the best food to eat. And when she, he did not fall for her charms, she threatened him, but he remained inflexible. And that account says that her attraction to Joseph was so strong that she got sick. You know it can happen, right? She got sick. And on one occasion, she said, uh, when, when the noble ladies of Egypt had come to see her, she told her maid to give them oranges. And she sent Joseph in to serve the oranges. And the women were there and they were peeling the oranges and, you know, they were unable to take their eyes off Joseph so much so that one of them cut her finger. The story goes. And then, as they couldn't help take their eyes off him, Potiphar's wife said it, what would you do? She told the women, what would you do if, like myself, you had this man in front of your eyes every day? You just came here once and you're cutting your finger. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, of that famous incident, uh, this slide's not working anymore, we read, which we read in the Bible, that story, which I just told you. And um, Potiphar's wife couldn't keep it any longer. She found an occasion when they were alone and she pretended that she was sick so that Joseph could come in and pay attention to her. And the Bible says that Joseph did not fall for the trap. That feeling was not mutual. Joseph recognized that his responsibility was not just to a human being, but it was to God. He recognized, he recognized that it goes beyond just integrity of service. It goes into the realm of worship. He feared God. He said to Potiphar's wife, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my master? He didn't hear that. You should have corrected me. And how can I do this great wickedness and sin against whom? I dare not. God deserves my best. If you didn't hear what I said before, and if you plan to be asleep after this, go home with that sentence. What was that sentence? God deserves my best. Can I hear the church say that? God deserves my best. When I come back to preach here next, stop, next time, I'm going to ask you what that sentence was. And what will you tell me? God deserves my best. What is it, Sean? What is it, Jackie? What is it, Brother Tainton? What is it, church? God deserves my best. Amen. God deserves my best. So as I try to wrap up today, can I submit to us that in the conduct of our everyday lives, God deserves nothing less than our best. And that's a way of rendering to him worship. Many people today are prudent and they are careful in their business. They go from virtual obscurity and nothingness to fame and prominence, prominence multi-billion dollar industries climb the ranks of leadership in the world and in the church, but many of them stop short of recognizing the total claims of God and all that they have, or simply the fact that he is, he is the one who has given them all that they are enjoying. And that's where the line of distinction must be drawn between the average person and a true discipleship. What is the issue here? For me, the issue is not 
just about me having a good reputation, making a name for myself. The issue is what? Who gets the glory? It's not about who's watching. It's not about who's watching. Joseph could have said, my boss is not there. He's not watching. I do a good job otherwise, but he's not here today. So I'm going to, mm, whatever that was, make, whatever you translate that to mean. But no, he knew that it went further and he could not glorify God by doing what Potiphar's wife wanted him today to do. And so the question is, how can I do this? How can I withhold from God what he wants me to give to him? My money, my tithe, my offerings, my influence, all the stuff that is holy unto God. How can I withhold his Sabbath from him? You know, how can I use this day for my own purposes when the Bible says it's holy unto God? You get where I'm going? All of that is part of stewardship. How can I use this body as I please when it is supposed to be the temple of God? Question, who gets the glory? God wants us today to move beyond our human limited perceptions of integrity and penetrate into the realm of worship. How will this glorify God? He wants us to get to the point where we always stop and ask this question. How will this glorify God? Amen. 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 This is the time where you think about what you've heard and tell God what you want to do. Sermon done. This is where you talk to him. And after that, I come in with a prayer and we affirm together our decision. So this is your time where you talk to God. Say, Lord, thank you for speaking to me, and I just want to tell you this. Thank you, Father in heaven. Thank you for speaking to us today through the story of Joseph. And thank you for reminding us that you are owner, you are in charge, and you've just entrusted us with positions of responsibility, with possessions, with time, with bodies, with influence, with all the gifts. And that we are to use these gifts to give you honor and glory. May we, as Paul enjoins may we do like we're serving you and not serving humans and may we remember that it is to you that we have to give account so help us to remember the example of joseph who chose to serve you rather than to compromise his integrity we thank you for taking us from our nothingness and bringing us into your family for exalting us to great positions of responsibility in your kingdom. Father, I pray that we will be found faithful as good stewards. And I thank you for the commitment that we've all made today. Pray that you will keep us through your Holy Spirit, that we'll serve you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <laughs>